For most of the world, the region of Xinjiang remains a very large mystery. Its name directly translated means New Frontier, and it is an important region in northwest China that shares a border with eight other countries, including Russia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and India. With a documented history of over 2,500 years, the region of Xinjiang was a vital hub on the ancient Silk Road. Fast forward to today, and the region contains over 20% of China's fossil fuel reserves, and again is an important hub on China's new Belt and Road Initiative, the largest infrastructure project the world has ever seen. Now, the region of Xinjiang is not without its controversy. The region was plagued by deadly terrorist attacks for many years, and there has been recent accusations from Western governments around the world that there is a potential genocide going on in the region. Now, in today's episode of Real Talk China, I'm going to be interviewing two foreign expats on the ground in China that were interested in learning more about this specific region. They decided the best way to do this was to personally fly to Xinjiang and experience it firsthand and to document their travels. I'm very honored to bring them into the studio to share with everybody their adventures, their experiences, and to let us all better understand the mysterious region of Xinjiang. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, welcome to Episode 5 of Real Talk China. All right, everybody, I'd like to welcome into the studio for our next episode. This is Fernando and Noel, uh, who are you know joining me today to really talk about their recent trip to Xinjiang. Gentlemen, how are you this evening? Very good. Thank you. Um, great. And first off, I would like to thank you very much for the opportunity to join you. It's, uh, it's great to, to have this opportunity to meet you finally and to share uh, our experiences. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Let's just start off with a simple question. You know, what what got you interested in going to Xinjiang? You know, what was the first idea? Say, all right, let's let's make this trip a reality. There were, there were silly things and there were important things. One of the silliest things, uh, and it's just what it is, people tell you, oh, you haven't been there, so how can you talk about it? Mm -hmm. Okay, now let me go and then that's out of the table. Nobody can tell that, <laughs> tell yeah. me that ever again. Um, but of course, that was not the main reason. But for me, it was, I was really tired of hearing all these nonsense and uh, knowing what I know about China, uh, it, it just didn't add up. So right. I wanted to go there and, and, and see and make a couple of videos about what I thought people were not seeing people were not understanding about China. Um, and uh, I wanted to see for myself. That's basically the reason why I decided to go. I talked to my wife and said like, hey, we got a couple of days off. What do you think about going to Xinjiang? So like, what? I'm like, yeah, let's just go. Have you always been interested in going to Xinjiang? Actually, I had not known about Xinjiang since uh, the beginning. You know, my geography is pretty bad. Yeah. But uh, as uh, they speak more and more about it, then yeah. that obviously got my attention. That was it. I just I just went there with uh, with open mind. I had not I had nothing. Well, I had, I had really no expectations. I was just going there with an open mind, right? Not sure what to expect. And in the end, I was just pleasantly surprised at the normalcy of people living there. I love the children who are looking so happy. Nice. And I just love taking pictures of portraits and I got quite quite a few in my collection. So, yeah. One of the biggest things that we do as content creators talking about China is, you know, I know we, we do get a lot of uh, feedback from people. And I think, unfortunately, for many of these people that are, you know, against China, a lot of them haven't actually been to the country. And there's a lot of mm -hmm. stereotypes, you know, misconceptions. And I think one of the things that many foreigners probably don't know about China is how, you know, ethnically diverse it is. And I, I, I always kind of give this analogy. I say China is more like a continent than a country in the sense that, you know, you can have so many different experiences, right? You go out to Xinjiang, you know, it's like traveling to the Middle East, you know, different, you know, uh, topography, you know, different languages, different style of food, religion. It's a very, it's like going to another country. And, and that's what makes China so unique. Obviously, there's 55 different ethnic minorities in China. So give us a little bit um, about your travel. How long did you go for? What was your itinerary? What was your cities? Give us a little overview as we jump into this conversation. Our arrangements were quite simple. I said, like, look, everybody talks about Kashgar. Everybody talks about Hotan. And everybody talks about Urumqi. Mm -hmm. So why don't we fly to Urumqi, 
take an overnight train from Urumqi to Kashgar. So we could actually talk to people on the train. It's a very slow train. Uh, we flew from Kashgar to Hotan, uh, spent uh, some time in Hotan, and then we flew back to Urumqi and then back to Shenzhen. So the whole thing was three nights, four days. Four days. Um, for me, it was just I'm going there to shoot videos um, that I could have made here in my studio. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to make a point that you can travel to Xinjiang. If you want to know what Xinjiang is like, go over there. You can do it. And you can shoot videos in Xinjiang. Nobody is going to stop you and tell you, you can't shoot, you can't do this, you can't do that. Right. Is it, uh, there's, there's an element that um, Jerry Gray, uh, which perhaps your audience, is, uh, your audience knows, um, he told me something very interesting. He said, like, look, all these stories that the media keeps feeding us is what makes is what's making you afraid of going. Because right. I was like Jerry, what's it gonna be like? Will mm -hmm. I be able to shoot? Are they gonna stop me? Are they gonna <gasps> will I get in trouble? And like, what are you talking about, Fernando? Just go there, it's normal. You're right. just paranoid from everything that you hear, from right. everything that you've seen on the media. And it couldn't be any more true. We got there and nobody really cares. Let me let me ask one question. So I think one of the things that for foreigners, as we're looking at, you know, Xinjiang and, and people kind of think it's probably an area that's completely closed off. I mean, are you do you need a special type of travel permit? Do you need a special visa? Do you need to you know, is it as easy as yeah. I'm in Xinjiang, I'm going to go on my you know sea trip app. I'm going to just book a flight and then bam, I can go to Xinjiang. Do you need any special arrangements with the government to go there? I think I think that the ignorance of a lot of Westerners is that they confuse it with Tibet. Right. If you want to go to Tibet, you do need to get a special pass. Right. But this, I mean, you don't need to go with a tour. You just buy a ticket. Now, I have okay. to say one thing. There was a bit of a of a an uptick of um, COVID nineteen in Yunnan, if I'm not mistaken, and because of this, a lot of hotels stop taking foreigners. Right. So that was the challenge, like kind of like yeah. finding hotels that would take foreigners. The only thing that was complicated, um, every city that we went to, we found a place that would take them. And yeah, that was it. But in terms of getting to the place, nothing. You just go to the airport, show your passport, your ticket, and you're good to go. And I think that's that's one of the good things that you guys did, right? You know, Xinjiang's a really, you know, it's a very hot topic right now in China and around the world. And you said, "Hey, let's let's go let's go have a look." And I think that's a really important perspective. Uh, Jerry Gray, who you mentioned earlier, um, you know, I've connected with Jerry. He's based down in Zhongshan, down in southern China, and he's done many uh, biking trips. I believe he's on a biking trip right mm -hmm. now, uh, cycling across yeah. China. And I know he's. I think he's cycled. I think he's been to Xinjiang. I'm going to say at least four times, uh, multiple times. Yep. He's biked extensively throughout Xinjiang. He's had many experiences with the locals there. Mm -hmm. So again, a really valuable perspective when you're on the ground and you can, you know, you can say, hey, I've been to Xinjiang, I've seen what's going on. There was a discussion. There were people, when I said I want to go to Xinjiang and I started talking to people, some people said, hey, maybe we can help you, you know, organize something. And I said, like, I don't want that. This yeah. is a very important part. I, I wanted to go as an independent foreigner, YouTuber. Yeah. I didn't want anybody helping me uh, get permits to go to this place. Uh, nothing. No coordination, no nothing. Just the more natural, the more genuine my experience or our experience, mm -hmm. the, the more we can, we can tell people that if it works for us, it works for everybody else. So that's an important thing to, to mention. I don't know. Yeah, um, I, think so. I think so. Well, I think that is. No, I, th I think it's really valuable because I think what's important to understand is, you know, all of us are independent content creators. And I think there's, you know, potential opportunity, you know, for example, if, if let's say, I think you're referring to like, oh, if, if CGTN or somebody was to, if you're going to go on like a sponsored trip, you know, from one of China's networks, mm -hmm. you know, you're probably going to get some criticism online, right? Well, you know, you, you're... Yeah colluding with the government or you know you're obviously going on a sponsored trip so you're going to see what only what they want you to see and i think it's important you know if you're going to go to that region you know be independent like you said there's no restriction just go to the airport buy a ticket mm -hmm. fly right in 
Guys, let me, let's jump right in. I want to know about, um, you know, what was your first impression? So you flew into Kashgar, right? That was your first city that you started? Urumqi. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Urumqi. No, Urumqi. Okay, Urumqi. And Urumqi is the capital of the Xinjiang province. That's so right. You've flown, That's so you've flown into there, and what's your first experience? You know, you're on the ground there. You know, um, what's the impressions? What does it look like compared to other cities in China? Urumqi, as I touched down in the airport, it was actually a very modernized airport. Mm -hmm. I had uh, a clip on that. The taxis were outside waiting for us. It was a smooth ride to the city center. They even mm -hmm. had a, a, a subway line that links uh, the city center to the airport that we found out later. So okay. for us, um, the impression, well, for me at least, the, you know, Rumchi is just like maybe Shenzhen back 10 mm -hmm. years ago where it's developing. Yeah. Not yet the metropolis that Shenzhen is today, but, you know, what I saw... Uh, in Romchi then is reminds me of what I saw in Shenzhen like 10 years ago. So nice. that is pretty much to me like city. You can go there. It's like for sightseeing. It's for tourists. Now, when we got to Kashgar and Hotan, it's much different. Okay. Uh, less high-rise buildings. Uh, in fact, I got a nice shot of uh, what was outside my hotel uh, window. It's all like flat ground. Okay. And uh, yeah, and uh, in Hotan, it was also like we went to many areas that were like plantations. Mm -hmm. So yes, a very different feel between Hotan, Kashgar, and I'm sure other parts of Xinjiang as well as compared to Urumqi. Yeah. Fernando? Um Urumqi is in the north of Xinjiang. And this is one of the things that a lot of people who like to talk talk about uh, Xinjiang don't really know or understand. The northern part of Xinjiang is much more developed than the south. Okay. And the presence of the Han uh, people, the Han Chinese, is much more, uh, it's higher in the right. north than in the south. In the south, that's when you find other minorities like the Uyghur and many others. So gotcha. that's, a, that's a, one of the issues um, within the region is that that Urumqi is a, is a is an area that has developed much faster. It's much more modern. There's many more services. There's yeah, it, it, you find your McDonald's, Burger Kings, malls, all these kind of things. While in the south and in Kashgar, um, you don't you don't see too much of that. Okay. So this. Um, on balance, this not is not even the development of the region. That is one of the things that, well, they're they're trying to change. They're trying to make these cities a lot more modern, a lot more sophisticated, a more more attractive for tourism and things like that. So yeah. when you go there, you do that. You do see that difference between wow. I think that's important context to know because as as we know, China has been developing all of the cities. There's a tremendous amount of development in China, but one of the big things that we all know is China's government is you know, all about reducing poverty. Poverty alleviation has been a very big campaign. I think you know, obviously improving infrastructure, improving education, and creating these pathways for better jobs. I, I know, you know a handful of friends that are you know, Han Chinese that were born in Urumuchi or Kashgar, and you know they have you know obviously there's a very big um, you know it's not just the Uyghur population there obviously there's a lot of Han Chinese there as well and it, it's a very dynamic mix there you know of different people. What about what about um, you know language when you're out on the streets? Is it very common to see um, you know bilingual signs and everywhere you go? I mean, are you having you ha you would have the, the Uyghur script which looks like Arabic script? Um, I'm assuming that you would see that pretty much everywhere, correct? Correct. From Everywhere. the airport to the taxis to to uh, leaflets, uh, promotional stuff, restaurants, everything. Everything is um, you 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 struggle to find English. Actually, right. uh, there's always this Arabic and and uh, then there's uh, Chinese. Yeah. And if you're lucky, you get some English. Mm -hmm. We're riding in the car and the guys listening to the radio. <laughs> And that is 87.8 FM Kashgar. It's everywhere. Everywhere you see and you hear uh, their language being kept and, and nurtured and maintained. We had an interesting in situation with a taxi driver. Do you remember, Noel? There was a taxi driver whose Chinese was so poor 
Okay. My, my oh. wife is Chinese and she was talking to him and she's like, I don't understand what he's saying. And, and yeah, he didn't enough. understand what she was saying. And, and uh, we basically showed him the address and he took us there. But we managed to understand that he regretted not having learned Mandarin because right. nowadays it, it, it affects his business. Yeah. Now you got China wanting to be a very important player in the world economy. Well, <laughs> if you want to get into this possible future, better future, you got to speak Mandarin. And within their the boundaries of their country, they have to do it. Very good perspective. No, I think, I mean, it's the other thing that's funny is, is when you look at Western culture in North America and Europe, very affluent families are spending premium money to have their children, you know, learn Mandarin, right? You know, Donald Trump's grandchildren speak fluent Mandarin. You know, it's, I mean, Barack Obama's daughters are learning Mandarin. I mean, you know, world leaders, affluent people are spending huge amount of tuitions for private Chinese tutors because like, it's the language of the future. But yet when Chinese people mm -hmm. inside of China are learning it, it's like, well, they're being oppressed. You know, it's like, no, it's actually, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, employing them for a better life. You know, and, and again, I mean, Mandarin, yeah, I mean, Mandarin is the most spoken language in the world. I mean, if you're going to learn that, fantastic. You're going to have a lot more opportunities in, in, in your life. Guys, let's talk about, let's talk about religion. Let's talk about the Uyghur culture. And I want to talk about, you know, from your three cities that you traveled and everywhere you went, what was the presence of the Muslim culture? You know, as far as how many, did you see a lot of uh, mosques, uh, you know, and throughout your travels in that region? I've heard there's up to, you know, 25,000 different mosques, you know, throughout the Xinjiang region alone. You know, were you able to see people, you know, practicing their religion, praying, you know, things of this nature? Tell us a little bit about that. My uh, visual understanding of mosques from Singapore is that they were structured in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So when I was looking for these things, they were actually not present, but they were actually there. So Fernando was the one that pointed out to me that these are mosques when I okay. didn't actually know that these are the, the mosque. So okay. Fernando can add on to that. <laughs> yeah, the, the thing is that we, when we think of a mosque, we think of like a grand structure. Correct. Yeah. Think of Istanbul, think of uh, Xi'an, right? But mosques are like churches. I mean, you can have churches that are tiny, small, like just a congregation where people go there and pray. Right. Uh, so we're walking around the street, like that's a mosque, that's a mosque. And like, Huh? <laughs> and yeah, they don't really yeah. look what you picture, the big dome. The, no, it's just mm, right. mosques are, are, are everywhere. Um, the one thing that to me was interesting, um, two things I want to mention. Number one, we're in Kashgar. We're out there in the countryside having the most amazing Yang Ro Chuan. Nice. You can't imagine. It was the best thing in the world. And the person across from our table started praying before eating his food an older man it was like all right this is this is interesting to actually see it in in real life in action but what's um did, now did you guys get off the beaten path a little bit did, I, did you did you get a chance to go visit some um some cotton farmers i thought you did you guys were able to do something like that get out to the farmland we tried to so yeah. in uh, hotan we rented a car Oh, nice. And, uh, this, uh, well, we didn't drive. There was a driver that <laughs> drove driver. Yeah. yeah. So, so she brought us to, um, well, first of all, out in the plantations. And that's where we saw the various uh, crops, like uh, for wood and for, I think it's walnut or something, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Uh, yeah. But I could be wrong. And then we finally, you know, uh, said, could you take us to a cotton farm? Because that seems to be the thing we want to have a look to see if yeah. there's actually any forced labor in this cotton farms, right? So she said, okay, uh, she'll bring us to one. And uh, we travel for like 30 minutes on the highway. And this is like in the desert. Uh, okay. got some good footage on it, which is coming up in my third part of my uh, Xinjiang series. Okay. So once we reach the uh, location, and basically it's a gantry, it's a gantry. And, you know, we again had to dismount from the vehicle and go to the guard post to sort of uh, show ID. Okay. And that's when we got a roadblock because as Fernando mentioned just now earlier, he mentioned that, uh, you know, at this particular checkpoint, we were not, not allowed to venture further. Okay. That's because we had no prior uh, arrangement to go in there. Right. And because of the... COVID situation plus the fact that this is a different area from Hotan. It's not exactly Hotan. 
right? It, we're actually entering a different district. So there's okay. another set of different, uh, I guess, uh, permutations or regulations. Right. So that was our date end. Had we been able to enter, then we would have gone to the cotton field at least, but we will stop there. Every single city and every single town has a different regulation uh, on COVID. Okay. Let me explain. In Urumqi, we bring our green code from Guangdong. Mm -hmm. Welcome, sir. Come on in. It's valid. Okay. We arrive in Kashgar. Oh, you have a green code from Guangdong. Beautiful. But you need to do another test. So you had, to do, a, province, you had to do a COVID we, test while you were there? We, we, yes. yes, we had to do a new test in Kashgar oh, when we arrived. And that's when we wasted like two or three hours. And right. um, in, in, in this particular place in Hotan, it said like, well, here... You also need to do another test. That's when we arrived at this gantry where we were about to enter the, the area where the cotton fields are. And they said, like, you need to do another COVID test. It will take another three hours. And we're like, wow, we don't have that time. Right. We don't have the the, the, the possibility to wait uh, and, and go. And right. then we said, like, but, but why do you want to go there? Like, we want to shoot. I said, like, well, here's an interesting thing. If you want to shoot, you actually need to ask for a permit. So okay. there's two different things, okay? One is the COVID situation. We right. needed to take a, a, a test to be able to go in. And if we wanted to shoot, we had to get a permit, um, which is why uh, all these journalists that go there, they must have a permit. They must have a permit to go in, right? right. And the second thing that the man told us is like, and... Once you get your permit, you are assigned a, a, a chaperone or, or an yes. escort or whatever you want. Well, in, in the, the proper term, somebody who goes with you. Right. And those are the cars that you see following the journalists. Gotcha. Oh, we're being followed. We're being followed. <laughs> that's the arrangement, my dear sir. Yeah. That's, that's the way it is over there. If you're going to shoot and document, you will be followed. There will be somebody going with you. Okay. And people might ask and wonder, oh, but why? But why? It's not free. Well, because of all the damage that's being right. caused in the past. Because I think this is something that often gets, you know, really lost in this whole Xinjiang narrative is the fact that, you know, how disruptive uh, terrorism, you know, really was in the region, you know, for many years. You know, I first went to China in 2007 um, you know, up and let's say up until 2007, it was relatively peaceful. Starting in 2008, you know, really through 2014, there was a tremendous amount of terrorism attacks that were happening inside the region of Xinjiang and then actually spread to other areas as well. You know, we think of the Kunming, you know, train, uh, train station disaster, where I believe there was over 50 people that lost their lives in a stabbing attack, you know, which is just you know, really hard to imagine, you know, that, um, you know, that something like that could happen. But obviously, this was a domestic terrorism uh, problem. It was very prevalent, you know, in, in Xinjiang. Um, and I think this is, you know, certainly why there's added a security. And, and I think that's kind of where I wanted to go when you talk about these checkpoints and things. There's obviously a much higher level of security in Xinjiang, probably compared to anywhere else in China. Would you guys agree with that? Yes. yes, and I like to add a little That's bit on yes. uh, what Fernando mentioned about the, the following guy is because even yeah. if you go into a factory and if you want to do some videography there, you right. will be followed by somebody from the factory. It won't right. be a free for all, mm -hmm. right? Here's the, the door to the factory. Go ahead and do what you like. No, the factory will assign somebody to follow you and see what right. you're taking, right? Because I, That's probably pretty standard yeah. practice where I yeah. imagine you're in Germany and you wanted to go to a a Volkswagen uh, factory. I'm, I'm, I don't think you can just walk in and start filming everything. Show um, me the, the emissions monitoring system, please. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We're going to avoid that section over there. Yeah, I'd, like, I'd like to add a little bit more about the, the whole um, strictness in terms of COVID testing in Xinjiang. Okay. I think it's also because that it also shows, in my opinion, that the Chinese government is making sure that this ethnic group doesn't get exposed to the deadly disease. Right. Everybody in Xinjiang, where we were at, Uramchi, Kashgar, Hotan, we were all masked up. Gotcha. We are pretty much relaxed in Shenzhen, uh, Guangzhou, I think. But in right. Shenzhen, for sure, we, we can basically go around without mask, only right. in the confined space, like a, like a bus, 
the train station, uh, even in departmental yeah, stores, we are free not to have the mask, right? It's, it's optional. But in where we were at in, in Xinjiang, everybody, including us, we we're all masked up. We were not allowed mm -hmm. to like go without the mask. That's number right. one. And number two, I think China has exhausted so much funds for controlling the virus that they cannot afford another such incident. Wave. Right? The, the country has taken such a hit with all the free testing, free everything, you know, building the, the hospitals and all these things, vaccines. There's, it has done so much that, you know, you don't come and destroy what we have, you know, preserved China. right here. So it's, Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. Well, China's done an amazing job controlling COVID. I mean, we know that. I mean, they were the first country in and really the first country out. Um, obviously, it's still, you know, a concern and we still need to be, you know, vigilant on, you know, controlling COVID. But I, you can certainly understand, you know, the desire to make sure that the situation is under control. And I think obviously that's why you see still strict measures of anybody flying into the country. And like you said, even, even that uh, domestic travel, you know, going from different regions in China, especially if there's a flare up, you know, in, in Yunnan province, you know, all right, let's make sure that everything's under control. So I want to talk about a little bit of um, interaction with the locals that you've had there. I mean, well, you, you mentioned, you know, you like to take a lot of photographs. You, show, you showed me some of the great photographs you took of some of the, the local kids. And I'm just kind of wondering your interaction, you know, where, where, um, where the local Uyghur kids, you know, were they interested to see a couple of foreigners and, you know, you know interact? And how, what was your interactions with them? Did you manage to have any chats with some with some, uh, you know, some of the youth there or just some normal people, you know, what was your sense of their, you know, quality of life and what they are doing on a daily basis? All right, Cyrus, thanks for that question because I actually did uh, chat with uh, a couple of people. Okay. Um, I wish I could have chat more. Mm -hmm. I was basically maybe a little bit uh, shy myself. Okay. Uh, first time going there. I mean, I've never done this kind of thing before. I've never chatted with people and interviewing them. So it was a first for me. But when I was trying to get some coffee for us, me and Fernando, and of course his wife, while they were filming, I chanced upon a coffee shop and uh, there was this lady inside and I just chatted with her casually and I thought, oh, she's quite, recept quite receptible to, to my chat. So I asked her, could I, could I video you, right? Me asking you questions because I was do I'm doing this on my, my vlog. She said, okay. So okay. I chatted with her. She's basically a fourth generation Uyghur. And okay. she stays in the city of uh, ancient city of Kashgar, and right. she's just basically describing how life has been so much improved that they didn't even have sewage and uh, clean water to drink back in oh. the day when you have to go line up, you have to queue up to get your drinking water. Oh. So everything now is just at the turn of a tap. So that is that is the proof that you know life in Kashgar has improved, such that she is now you know working in a coffee shop with two children. Uh, her husband is working as well, nice. and you know her her boss is uh, Shanghainese, and she told she told me that the boss even invited her to go to to Shanghai. Nice. And on the second occasion, I talked to another vendor in in the ancient city of Kashgar. He is making musical instruments, right, okay. wooden crafts and stuff like that. So he has a factory about five kilometers out. He employs about ten people, nice family, a wife, two kids. A eldest daughter and a, a young son, beautiful people. I interviewed him. Nice. But unfortunately, he didn't allow me to use the interview for the vlogs because what I what happened was we agreed on videotaping the whole thing, okay. and he had a change of mind. After that, he said, "Please delete away the video," and okay. that's when I it, it caught me. It really hit me that why are there people who are afraid or uh, apprehensive? And to add to that, even on the last day of our trip, I was in the park and I took pictures of a very beautiful uh, Uyghur young girl and her mother, right? I exchanged WeChat with them. I sent them the pictures that I took. And I basically wanted to uh, support my interview with more images of the people I interacted with in Xinjiang. So I send her a WeChat and say, oh, can I actually use your pictures? I'm doing an interview with uh, Guangdong TV. Yeah. She said, no, please don't use my pictures. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of strange that uh, they are not so, you know, they are, there's, there's something that's, that's preventing them from saying, oh, it's no problem. Go ahead. You know, 
there's some oh, reservation. You know, you know, to be honest with that, just to play um, kind of devil's advocate on that, you know, what, what's really interesting is, is um, you know, many of you probably have noticed, you know, I have a wife and three kids. Uh, you will not be able to find any photos of my family in my YouTube stream or my social media. And that, that's just, you know, my wife is very adamant. She's just big on privacy. You know, you could speculate and say, oh, you know, the, these people are scared of the Chinese government. Or you could say, simply say that, you know, a lot of times people don't really like to have their image mm -hmm. online. People talk to foreigners, uh, journalists, whatever, and then they take their words, twist them, and put out a report or a video that is going to be detrimental to the economy, to, to, to the region, to the development, to their livelihood. So a lot of people, this is how I see it. Yeah. They're like, I don't want to talk to foreigners with cameras. Yeah. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be that the government tells them not to. It's just that they're being hurt. That's it's just that they've seen what happens when they open their mouths and talk to foreigners with an agenda. So why would they trust you? Yeah. Why would they trust me? Why would they trust anybody else when they have experienced these, well, the, the negative consequences of doing so. So is it a government uh, order? Who knows? But right. common sense will tell you, if you see what's happened when you did this before, why would you do it again? If Fernanda, you see what happened to this person, right. do you know what I'm saying? You, you brought up a good point, and I've actually mentioned this in a previous video where I, I remember there was, a, a, I think it was a BBC reporter or somebody from a Western media that was based in Beijing and I remember they had traveled to, um, you know, southern China to a very poor village that, you know, had, you know, had recently gone through a very big poverty alleviation and, you know, campaign. And they said, yeah, you know, we're really happy with the Chinese government. Um, you know, look at our village like we basically had same, similar thing. We didn't have running water, you know, and now we do. And it's really improved the quality of our lives. And the BBC journalist is like, wow, the brainwashing is amazing. They actually support the government. And, and, and it was, and it was like, I'm like, how can you, how can you classify that as brainwashing when this is a tangible result that has improved in their life? I mean, to get back to the most basic things in our lives right now, I mean, you know, food, shelter, better jobs. I mean, these are the things that really drive an economy. And again, you know, when we're focusing on improving the quality of life for citizens, there is no argument that China's government has done a great job in, in lifting these people up, you know, across the board. Um, and I think that, and that was amazing when I, I, I kind of called her out in a video, just saying, can we just take that for what it's worth? You know, why, why does it when somebody in China says something positive about the government that it's immediately labeled as these people are brainwashed, you know, China's brainwashing efforts seem to be working. These people actually liked the government. Well, if you're in a rural village and you had no water and now I can turn on a tap, like you said, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to feel better about things. I'm going to be, you know, optimistic about you know, my government. So that's a good perspective you brought up. Um, gentlemen, let's, let's wrap up this chat. I mean, it's been, it's been really great. I mean, I could talk to you both for hours about this, but um, let's start with, uh, what's, what's your lasting impression? You know, let's have a closing statement, your lasting impression on Xinjiang. Fernando, we'll start with you. What do you, what do you, what do you want everyone to know about Xinjiang and kind of summarize your experience there? Harmony. There is a prize for peace there is a prize for harmony when you are coming from a very troubled past there are measures that need to be taken in order to recreate the values that are that are common to harmonious living they will ease up uh, afterwards but for the time being the situation is not normal it's not a normal transit it's not normal you have to do all these checkings so i i can't wait for the time where all this is of the past because right. it's an absolutely beautiful region mm -hmm. the people have a very colorful culture and i can't wait to go again nice. i can't wait to go again nice no, tell us your final, your closing thoughts. Your, your, well, about me, your... I think that the level of security would not ease up. Uh, in fact, I feel safe knowing that there's so many officers 
patrolling the streets and even the bazaar as we were enjoying our dinner. Yeah. So I think uh, plus the fact that you have uh, CCTVs every 100 meters, right? Yeah. We were basically unable to avoid any CCTV. Yeah. I think the, the security will, will remain and it's a good thing, not a bad thing. But what has gotten me as an everlasting impression at the moment is basically the people there, the children especially. Nice. Uh, I mean, the old people, I see the old people, right? They're, they're old and they're sort of like laid back. Some are, some are playing instruments. They like to... I mean, the, the culture is there. You can see the culture. The fact that they're playing traditional mm. cultural instruments shows you that there's a culture that's still there. It's not, it's not missing. They are making their cultural wooden crafts. Mm -hmm. And the children, their children are beautiful. Right. And yeah, same thing. I, I, I would love to go back again and I'm planning something hopefully in the near future. Yeah, fantastic. Well, you know, it's interesting mm -hmm. when we talk about the Uyghur culture, there's a few celebrities that are... Um, you know, that are Uyghur, you know, that are, that are, have big voices. I know there's, um, you know, there's a popular singing show in China as well that, you know, people, I know one of the performers in there was Uyghur and was doing a, you know, performance in the Uyghur language. And, you know, I think it's, again, I think that's just something that I want people to really understand more about China is how ethnically diverse it is and how, you know, it is an amazing, it is an amazing part of China, you know, how, and again, I, I love that analogy that it's more like a continent than a country and, you know, you could travel for months upon months, you know, and have so many different experiences and, you know, different foods and languages and cultural elements, you know, all within one country, you know, and that's really what makes China such a, you know, the middle kingdom. I mean, it really is one of the most fascinating countries in the world. So, um, gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for coming on uh, Real Talk China. It's been a pleasure chatting with you both. And I look forward to continue, um, you know, you know, connecting with you and, and seeing more of your travels in China. Hopefully, you know, you guys get the chance to go back to Xinjiang again. And for everybody that's watching this, um, I'm going to put a link down to both of their channels down below. Make sure you subscribe to both of their channels as uh, Fernando and Noel are doing, you know, great work on YouTube as we continue to really help more people understand China and provide some really valuable perspective. Thank you for the opportunity, Cyrus. And it's a real pleasure also to, to be in contact with you. Absolutely. Same thing for me, Cyrus. Thank you very much for having me on and uh, look forward to seeing you in China. Absolutely. Well, as soon as we get this COVID situation, I'm coming back to China. Very much excited to connect with everybody on the ground and uh, you know, just get back to you know, one of the you know, fastest growing regions in the world. I mean, there's so much energy in China and you know, we need to share more of those stories. So gentlemen, thank you so much and we will see everybody in a future episode.